Welcome everyone to this special hangout on advanced pricing agreements. India announced an APA regime a couple of years back, and uh, uh, there have been uh, there have been a hectic filings from MNCs. Essential approach of MNCs is to get the certainty. I think the icing on the cake was the announcement of the APA rollback rules early this year, giving an opportunity to the companies to basically settle the trans pricing dispute for a span of nine years. In last few months, uh, uh, we have seen uh, signing of the bilateral APA, uh, first with Japan in, in month of December, uh, and uh, uh, early this uh, last week, uh, we have uh, the first APA being signed in the IT ITA sector, uh, which is which which is a significant uh, 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 progress uh, in the APA program. And uh, uh, what we hear is that the APA margin is uh, is about 17, 18 percent. Which is phenomenal. To discuss this uh, significant step, uh, we are glad to have uh, our panelists. Uh, and let me uh, introduce our panel for the evening. We have Mr. S. P. Singh, uh, the uh, a senior partner with Deloitte. He is joining us from Mumbai. We have uh, Hasnain Shroff. Uh, Dr. Hasnain Shroff is a partner with KPMG. He is joining us from Mumbai as well. We have uh, Mr. Vishal Rai, the partner from E N Y. Uh, he is based. He is joining us from Gurgaon. Uh, and of course, my colleague Nikita Kudwa, uh, she, she works on the transpricing portal of Tax Sutra, and she's joining us from Bangalore. Thank you so much, all of you, for for joining me this evening. And uh, uh, Hasne, let, let me begin with uh, with the recent uh, APA that you have signed on the IT ITA sector. What has been your experience? Uh, uh, how the APA authorities have looked at this most litigated sector uh, in the country when it comes to the transpricing? Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, let me just begin by saying that obviously uh, I, I may not be able to share a lot of things uh, on the specifics of the case, but I will. What I will do is I will share about the learnings from this as well as many other cases which we are handling. So I, I, in terms of what are the key uh, experiences and learnings from this AP as well as the other APs which are in pipeline, uh, I think uh, very clearly turns out is that this is a taxpayer driven process. So the faster the taxpayers are able to provide the information and they are able to drive the process, uh, things will move faster. That's clearly uh, one thing which I have seen. Uh, second very important thing is it's very, very important to uh, focus on the FAR analysis and uh, bridge the gaps out there. Because once the FAR is agreed, uh, I would say the second part of the benchmarking is a little bit much more easier. Yes, uh, no doubt there are uh, particular ranges which the government could have identified uh, for a particular sector, but it's very, very critical to drive home the point in terms of where in the entire value chain or the uh, supply chain, uh, where, do, where does India's services stand? And uh, right. just an uh, example of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, any BPO. Uh, in a banking industry, they would really look at whether you are falling in the front office, the middle office, or the back office, and within the back office, what is the uh, spectrum of services being handled. So I think these are some very, very critical, important points. And in addition to this, it's very important once the markups which have been uh, agreed. Uh, right. The thing is, uh, how will the AP be implemented? There are going to be a lot of practical challenges. And uh, some of the points could be is, how do you look at a segmental? How, what is the basis? Do you agree with a specific kind of uh, uh, allocation criteria? Or is there an approach whereby you could really do away with a segmental? So completely that particular uncertainty in terms of whether the segmentals have been prepared correctly or not, and somebody trying to verify them, that completely goes away. So I think that sure. is a very, very important point. And uh, practically, there are going to be issues in terms of uh, computation of the cost base where expenses have not been cross-charged to India and they are not forming part of the cost base. How do you address those particular situations? Then about the number of years which would have got covered in the current APA, which have already gone by one, the current uh, APA by two years. So for those particular uh, cases, what is the difference in the margin and do you really need to bring those money back into India? And uh, do you bring uh, that money along with the interest or there is some kind of a arrangement which you could agree with the authorities separately on those particular matters. 
So these are some of the domain, the high level kind of. Yeah, uh, first we will we'll touch upon some of the. We will touch upon some of the more specific issues. Uh, let me take this to Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh, uh, 17, 18 percent uh, is the is the APA range that 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 we are hearing. Your first reaction, uh, uh, you know, this this primary phase looks. Uh, Uh, looks uh, an amazing margin, which which most of the IT IT companies uh, would be uh, would be seeking for. Mr. Singh, your your initial comments. Uh, Amir, uh, you know when you are looking at any margin, it cannot be seen in isolation. Sure. Uh, it has to be seen in comparison to the margin which are being uh, put to the uh, taxpayers in the audit process by the transfer pricing officer. You have also to look at the margin uh, in respect of the settlements which are being raised in mutual agreement procedure and finally as uh, uh, as rightly said by asnan is that uh, one has to look at uh, the functions assets and risk of the particular company and one thing which uh, has come out in the recent uh, past is that the tax authorities are not trying to find out one margin which they can apply across the board they are looking at the functions very closely and uh, they have uh, already frozen or they have some idea which they have created in the map process which is going on with us so uh, that is a learning which they also have with the us authorities i think this margin if you look at 17 18% 16 to 18% in respect of uh, bpos i would say that uh, uh, you know by and large this is a very good bargain for taxpayers at it may be slightly higher than what the taxpayer would be expecting but if you think i mean uh, you know the hassles which are got ridden off in the apa process i would say it is a good bargain for uh, both sides for the tax department as well as for the taxpayers right we shall you to have been uh, uh, involved in uh, apas in this sector uh, what has been your experience so far uh, are you on the verge of uh, closure of uh, any of the apis uh, and what are the feelers that you are getting uh, in 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 this sector uh, and, and some of the issues uh, uh, and some of the cases involving it ita sector yes i think the experience has been pretty consistent with what hasnain and uh, what dr singh uh, mr singh shared a lot of emphasis on functional analysis where you are in the value chain complexity of what involved and all that so it's it's been quite a satisfactory process i think given the uh, you know given the number of apas in this uh, sector i think the ap authorities have been a little hesitant to share their comp set or basis of arriving at their uh, because they feel you know it will be discussed across the board and all that but yeah around the numbers that we hear are around 16 to 18 somewhere a little higher than 18 and all and i think it's definitely music to a lot of people's ears a lot of people have heard about this uh, you know range for uh, uh, a long time a lot of these companies who are in the apa actually wanted to buy piece and you know had increased their margin to as high as total cost plus 20 some of the smaller ones even to 21 22 unfortunately in an audit they were still adjusted to 29 and 30 so i'm sure while you know they would have ideally preferred closer to 15 but even 17 to 18 maybe 19 on the outer side they may not mind it too much but yeah it has to be seen in the context of the overall value chain so especially if you are in a third party bpo situation and if the total uh, you know amount or the total profit available in the value chain is not as much to compensate india at 18 and then also not give a you know somewhat reasonable return to the overseas entity then there can be some stress on it but on an overall captive ites uh, you know routine services 17 to 18 i think most people will take it uh, especially in a, in a lateral ap scenario right uh, mr singh uh, you touched upon a point around uh, the, during the so, uh, uh, yeah so that right uh, yeah uh, mr singh uh, you touched upon a point around uh, uh, the during the map process with usa uh, the indian authorities mentioned that they were working on a, a potential list of comparables specifically in it it sector 
uh, you also touched upon this. Uh, we have uh, two data points, so to speak, uh, in this current particular APA signed. Uh, we have been hearing a range of 16 to 18 percent. Uh, a few years back, there was a MAP agreed again in this sector, closer to 17 percent range. Uh, do you do you get a feeling that this is the uh, this is the range that uh, that Indian authorities would perhaps look at uh, for uh, for for most of the uh, APAs around IDIDS sector where there is a uh, where there is a cost plus captive kind of approach. Do you think that's that's a trend that that will emerge out of this? Uh, I do. I definitely say this now. Uh, what is the reason for saying that? I definitely say is that you know when we when the tax authorities uh, uh, you know are negotiating with. Uh, uh, the U.S. tax authorities. The one, uh, I mean, the interesting feature which is emerging is that they are not talking only with respect to the comparables and the margins there, but they are looking at uh, the cost base, and cost base is one parameter or a quantitative feature of what type of service is being rendered by a particular company. Let me explain it a little more. You know, the salary base uh, indicates if the number of the employees is the same or the per employee salary is one parameter for determining whether the services which are being rendered would be requiring a very high markup or a low markup. This is one parameter which has been used, I mean, uh, uh, to my knowledge, uh, by the uh, two tax authorities in determining what would be the right markup in respect of the services being provided by the Indian entity. And this is what I said earlier that the two authorities are not trying to find out one number and apply across 10 or 15 or 20 companies or applications. But they are trying to look at each company and this is what they have made very clear in their understanding that whatever number they are freezing uh, in the MAP process are not something which uh, will be there for next round of MAP uh, considerations. But uh, one point which I would like to make here is that when the authorities go through uh, you know, a, a thinking process to find out a solution that remains there in the system, not only the person who is negotiating but in the system as a whole. That is what impacts the, you know, the subsequent uh, actions of the authorities, whether it is in the MAP or in the APA. And the best thing will happen when these results which are reached in MAP or APA are adopted by the transfer pricing officer also during the normal assessment process. Because right. if, if they look at I mean, the functions and if they compare with the result which are there, which is available within the system, and come for that, a lot of litigation will be solved right at the beginning. Right, right. Asmin, uh, uh, you know, do your interactions uh, on APA, uh, uh, are you getting a number, are you getting a sense around APAs below 20%, uh, especially in ITA sector for uh, most of the uh, captive entities? Is that the sense uh, that, that, that you are getting in, in some of your? Uh, uh, IT, IDS sector clients? Yeah, so just I wanted to add one more thing to what Mr. Singh mentioned um, about the uh, margins, possible margins in the bilateral um, uh, scenario. I think you know, we clearly have indications that um, in case of bilateral APAs, there is a potential to go down much further than what has been agreed in this unilateral cases, or we can get agreed in the unilateral cases. So clearly, um, even during the course of negotiation process, the authorities where the taxpayers are not willing to look at these kind of margins where they believe even these margins are higher for them, they are suggesting them to uh, look at the bilateral route. And there are indications that already in the map process also, these rates could be on a lower side compared to these rates what we are hearing right now. And uh, on an overall particular perspective in terms of uh, the uh, margins which you are saying in the captive sector, yes, obviously we have these kind of uh, reference points available for IT, ITS. I think uh, they will always be sub below 20%, especially there is also, a, I would say, some kind of a cap in terms of um, these kind of back office operations. 
on the safe harbor rules so yes i agree they they will be always sub 20% subject to a caveat that if these activities are falling into some kind of high end activities because them saying also highlighted that you look at the salary cost and that's one kind of inference point and where the salary costs are much much higher i think that is where uh, the authorities as well as the revenue authorities want to look at these cases differently whether they fall in the definition of either high end activities or so called kpu activities right uh, vishal uh, both mr singh and hasan touched upon the cost base you also made a reference of it we been discussing about the margin part but uh, going little bit into specifics around cost base which is a very critical aspect especially in the cost plus uh, captives in it it is there are number of uh, issues around uh, which could be debatable issues for example uh, the foreign exchange earnings reimbursements uh, uh, support received from uh, from the parent company for example uh, you know assets given on loan and so on so forth uh, what has been your experience on the typical cost base for a typical uh, captive in idits when it comes to uh, uh, the unilateral aps shall yeah so we have had some yeah so we have had some discussions around it uh, we haven't closed on any of this some of our cases which are you know where the offer has been made and all that i think the cost base was pretty much fully loaded in couple of uh, cases they have asked for details around you know what is the provided free of cost or benefits that are given which are uh, you know not uh, not charged for by the parent company and all that uh, no closure on that but our reaction to that has always been that look even in a third party situation it's not unusual for third party principals to provide some benefit say in a contract manufacturing some molds and an it scenario say servers for testing some software and all that even in a third party situation you know unless it's hit that the real base of you know a completely inaccurate and representative cost base i think our uh, discussion has been that look nothing unusual this is in a third party right so nothing uh, that has been a deal breaker or anything yet uh, but yeah there's there have been few inquiries around it uh, so uh, so that's where that's where we are on that the pieces that are close to finalization uh, they, you know the cost base was pretty much loaded Hasan, any uh, any specific unique experiences in the cost-based discussions uh, around APS that you had on IDIG sector specifically? Yeah, so again, just to say that uh, not only for the case is concluded, but even for uh, all the cases which we are looking at, I think generally the AP authorities are asking the question to understand the cost base. So uh, we shall rightly mention that in third-party scenarios, there could be cases where uh, the there is a cost which is provided by the overseas entity. but from a apa press stand point of view uh, they are very keen to look at what kind of cost which are being uh, incurred and not being transferred to india and that is not included in the cost base of india if they genuinely required to be uh, incurred for the purpose of rendering of the service the expectation is very very clear that that has to be uh, computed either in terms of a cross charge to india or if that is not happening then the cost base needs to be emotionally adjusted and the markup has to be recovered accordingly so effectively what happens is they have to recover uh, the markup on that in case that cross charge is not coming to india right uh, let me move on to the bilateral apas which also i mean this last one year has been there has been a lot of activity india has had meetings with india uh, uh, usa there is a renewed dialogue uh, switzerland mr singh you been part of the first uh, bilateral apa that was concluded with japan uh, uh, what has what has been your experience uh, and how the competent authorities from the other side have been viewing the indian uh, apa process uh, you know i mean bilateral apa is, uh, is is challenging in the sense that there are two sides i mean uh, indian tax authorities in indian competent authority as well as uh, the indian unit and on the other hand uh, is uh, the other uh, competent authority and uh, you know the competing factor other 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 country 
So there are four players here. Uh, in respect of the unilateral, it's the two player. I mean, the Indian entity as well as uh, you know talking to the Indian authorities. But when it comes to bilateral, there are uh, four four. I mean, comp competing. I mean, uh, in groups talking to uh, reach a conclusion. Sure. That makes that makes the thing complex. But that also simplifies. Uh, you will be wondering why I am saying that four parties, and still I am saying that it simplifies, because at one point or the other, or for every point, there will be two persons talking the same thing. Uh, to clarify it, on any stand, there will be uh, you know either Indian and the uh, Indian competent authority and the Indian entity will be talking the same thing, which makes the discussion very very interesting. It's it's very uh, involved process, but at the same time, when you reach the conclusion, it is very satisfying also. Japan is uh, slightly uh, you know unique in the sense that the Japanese tax authorities have two very interesting features, which uh, I think uh, every uh, everyone should learn. One is that uh, the amount of the homework they do before they enter into any negotiation is mind-boggling. The second is that, uh, uh, in respect of any point, they want to take a principal decision and then try to form it across so that the same view is taken, uh, you know, in respect of uh, multiple or all the companies. So that makes the discussion. I mean, I take the discussion to a different level altogether. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, we shall, uh, uh, especially on the U.S. side, uh, uh, you know, are there any specific experiences? Uh, in, in your interactions, uh, uh, what has been the progress in last few months uh, on the bilateral APA discussions with USA? Yeah, so I think uh, the messaging from US competent authority, APMA team is clear that uh, look, we will we will definitely get into a bilateral APA discussion with India. Their preference and focus right now is to close at least substantial number of NAP cases in work for which was agreed in January this year for President Obama visited India. And also, uh, and when I say significant, at least like, you know, 50% or more, he would like to close. But uh, you had pre filing discussion uh, with, uh, with the US APMA uh, on, on cases. Uh, where, uh, but again, the preface is uh, they've clearly said that we would like to you know, even do the bilateral with those, with those companies who are in fact because they the queue earlier. Uh, so uh, that's that's the way it is going. So focusing on resolving the outstanding map cases, and then uh, focusing on uh, you know to start with companies who are going for bilateral APA uh, for when the map is already. In Right. Uh, so uh, specifically, uh, Michal, specifically on India USA, is there any specific milestone that the businesses should be watching for uh, on the APA uh, stroke MAP discussions? So I think uh, once you uh, so you know India India taxpayers or payments to India generally you know are. Uh, don't don't cross the materiality threshold from a U.S. IRS perspective, but if you are going to get into a bilateral APA discussion, then uh, one can't be too conservative from an India side and you know be closer to 20 or so because that clearly the U.S. IRS is not going to like. So closer to 15, I think Asnain made that point that mm -hmm. in a bilateral, I think the margins could be a little lower. And that's uh, probably true for not only UK but also for the US because uh, for them they really believe that cost plus 15 even with India's you know cost arbitrage and all that is is sufficient. So I think uh, one shouldn't be too too much higher. And I think even Australia has a similar uh, uh, you know similar approach. Right, Hasan, uh, uh, European side, I mean, India has had engagement uh, with UK, New Zealand specifically. Uh, any any specific aspects of their discussions that, that, that you have observed uh, which would be relevant for taxpayer and any other European jurisdiction uh, which needs to be washed out for? 
Yeah, so uh, not only European, I would say there are many other countries which are very large trading partners for India like Korea and Germany. And currently those treaties do not have this Article 9.2 clause and uh, India has taken a stand that whether Article 9.2 clause is not there, you would not uh, look at bilateral APAs. So my understanding is that there is a serious discussion in the government and uh, in most of the treaties which are now getting renegotiated, uh, this Article 9.2 clause would be inserted, meaning thereby the routes will open up for uh, bilateral APA for these particular trading partners also, which I think will be a very, very big kind of a positive uh, news for this particular kind of uh, Germany or Korea kind of headquartered companies. So Korea, I think, uh, has been uh, signed uh, but not notified. But I do not know whether 92 has been inserted. But my recent interactions uh, with senior people in the government they tell me that uh, that they are looking at revision of most of the treaties and to look at bringing 92 into picture. Right, Mr. Singh, any quick comment on 92 aspect? Uh, uh, that before, before I comment on 92, I would like to add here uh, one thing is that, uh, you know, uh, we have been interacting uh, with uh, different uh, authorities, uh, Japan is one which I mentioned, and then UK uh, as well as Switzerland. And what I have found, I mean, the approach of the Indian authorities or Indian competent authorities in all these negotiations, uh, I would say that, you know, they are very much aware that in any, any negotiation, uh, India would be uh, reducing the tax amount compared to what the transfer pricing officers have determined. And in many times, it is very, very substantial. It, it requires a lot of work by uh, the company and uh, whosoever is supporting them. But at the end of the day, it is the two authorities which have to be all. It should be acceptable to the two parties. And uh, I, would have, I would say that, uh, you know, recently on all the uh, negotiations, uh, the Indian authorities had uh, uh, has, has taken on very wide view. Now that is also getting reflected in what uh, Hasnan just said. I mean, regarding uh, paragraph two of Article nine, uh, they have appreciated that uh, you know if we look at the number of countries where this paragraph two is not there, and there is a historical reason. I mean, uh, uh, are, are the major trading partners? I mean. Uh, 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 with India, and therefore they require, I mean, paragraph to be introduced uh, until and unless they can find out some other way by which, uh, you know, this problem can be solved. So my, uh, you know, understanding is that the authorities are really very seriously looking at. Amending the treaty is not uh, very simple in the sense that if India wants to introduce paragraph 2, the other authority may like to introduce some other or like to change that. So amending uh, or renegotiating treaty requires a lot of time and uh, that is not the best solution. The best solution would be if India adopts an approach that even if paragraph 2 is not there, they can enter into the agreement and there are many books on international taxation which suggest that it is not necessary that paragraph 2 should be there for any country to enter into a bilateral APA. Yeah. Right, right, that's interesting. Uh, I, I think one of the reasons why APA activity has really picked up uh, has been APA rollback rules. Uh, we had these rules being notified uh, early this year and then there's an extension that happened. Uh, and we also have uh, FAQs being issued by CBDT. Uh, I think uh, most of these FAQs uh, are very clear. They specifically say yes or no. Can can I do in a particular situation a particular thing? Uh, FAQs are very clear. Uh, Vishal, uh, are you happy with the, the FAQ rule? Uh, FAQs on APA rollback uh, have been notified. Uh, of course, everyone will want more clarity, but but there's a step that has been taken by CBDT here. Uh, your quick reactions on APA rollback FAQ, Vishal? No, I um, I think most helpful. Uh, I think these rules are most helpful to clarify most of the points. So pretty unambiguous. Uh, uh, I think one of the asks of the taxpayers was around withdrawal of rollback. And uh, one of the fears they had as uh, on interpretations or statements by various people was if you have filed for a rollback 
and you don't want a rollback, you will have to withdraw from the forward as well. That's been clarified that you can withdraw from the rollback. Uh, and you can still go ahead with the go forward API. I think that's a big positive. So you know, with uh, you know, with the limited amount of time that was available in March, even if someone uh, you know, filed uh, for an uh, rollback and now you know, basis analysis or basis FAQ is uh, not keen to proceed with it, he can withdraw without sacrificing their go forward API. I think that's a big positive. Uh, uh, and uh, also the clarification around rollback and MAP. Uh, so, you know, draw from one of the two, I think uh, that's something that the taxpayers will have to map. <coughs> Can you still avail of the rollback? You have to choose either of the two. Uh, right, right. Withdraw from the map. It will have to be done with the associated or, or keep, it excluded, uh, keep it excluded from the rollback. The only thing I think uh, which uh, which is sort of fairly clear in the FAQ but should be need to be represented and discussed is that if the same transaction is there with another AE which is not there in a go forward APA, it will be kept outside the uh, ambit of rollback. Now that uh, I think uh, been clarified and it's pretty unambiguous but I think it doesn't make sense because the APA rules uh, for the go-forward APA clearly say that if the functional analysis of the transaction with an AE which is not existent at that time remains the same, the same APA will apply. So if you're billing to three entities on a cost plus basis, same functional profile and all that, then if you have a fourth entity, the same APA will apply. So applying the same rationale to the rollback, there really is no reason to exclude the rollback from a different AE if the functional right. analysis has been the same. So right. it's not an ambiguity issue, it's the position that they've taken. So I think we can discuss and you know make a representation to CBDT and uh, hopefully there'll be a resolution. It seems pretty straightforward. Right. Uh, Nikita, Vishal mentioned a point around uh, you know one of the issues where clarity is required. You looked at uh, uh, these uh, FHUs in detail. Uh, any specific issues that you've noted and uh, uh, perhaps uh, are other panelists uh, could be able to throw some light on some of the yeah. Right. Uh, Vishal, my question to you is, uh, you know, how is the APA rollback and ITAC litigation strategy being worked out? Uh, so how are you advising clients on what choice to make? Should they go for the APA or ITAC appeal route? No, I think it's a it's a very subjective, I mean, it'll, the answer to that will depend on a case-to-case -case basis. I mean, strategically, you, if you're you know not happy or if you think uh, you know the rollback would be at a higher than uh, you know, what the existing methodology is and you don't want to get into a discussion around payment of excess tax not get a credit or you can proceed with the IT matter if you're confident of your truth. and you know, once you buy the tax and that year automatically goes out of Rollback. However, if it's subjective issue, your taxpayers would prefer to go the APA route and slow pedal their IT. So, you know, one can also consider, you know, not filing, not going into the DRP, uh, you know, go ahead and file with the IT appeal process, or which is usually slower. So, you'll have a faster resolution in the IT rather than, uh, uh, sorry, faster resolution in the rollback as compared to the IT appeal and then IT. It will depend on case to case. But I think uh, it gives us a, it gives the taxpayers an opportunity to right. try to you know, par parallelly proceed with the options or make a choice, well-informed choice. Right. Let me, uh, Nikita, take this same question to Mr. Singh also. And here I'm, I'm in a very specific situation that those who have specifically opted for ro rollback, uh, at some point in time, there will be a, a decision to be looked at uh, whether to pursue the ITAD strategy or to pursue uh, with the rollback option. And what are the points that, that that need to be considered over here? Mr. Singh, how are you uh, looking at some of the client situations, uh, uh, especially on this uh, this issue? Uh, you know, as Vishal rightly said that there cannot be one answer for all the situations. It will totally depend upon you know particular case. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, why somebody has gone in the APA? Because otherwise, too, I mean, litigation is not 
something i mean you know which is totally against taxpayers in many cases tax tribunals are giving decisions which are in favor of uh, uh, taxpayers the reason is very clear it is to avoid protracted litigation the cost involved and the mental tension which goes along with the normal type of litigation so that is one factor which one keeps in mind when one has to take a decision whether one should go with the uh, roll back or uh, one should uh, you know pursue in the uh, in the normal litigation or the tax tribunal uh, so when when the matter comes i mean you know when you are negotiating apa you will have very clear idea that what type of the arrangement is going to be rolled back so that is the same arrangement which is going to be applied so you already have the point of uh, you know the point which will help you in taking a decision the tribunal one there are very few cases where they will be coming out and giving the decision so if you pursue tribunal doesn't mean that you will get the decision but if apa is already available and if it has it has to be rolled back then you already have a decision in your hand so that is one very very important factor in deciding whether one should go for the ap or for the tribunal but at the end of the day decision has to be taken in light of particular case where it is what is the amount of uh, you know the tax involved what's the stand of the tax tribunal in the other year all these factors will ultimately go in deciding whether one should go ahead with a or b right nikita yeah i'm yeah. Yeah, I also have a question for you, Hasman. Uh, the FAQ just stated that uh, you know while ALP could be different, the manner of determination of ALP for all the years should be the same. So does this mean that companies once selected as the creditors have to be selected for all the years and the consideration? And will ALP you know then differ based on only those the creditors manage? Um, yeah, see. Um it's very clear that uh, alp can be different for different years but what's more important is the methodology and the approach and the substance of the transaction has to be similar and in fact uh, it's a very very practical uh, issue which are likely to happen in a lot of cases where you will find that uh, the context of the transaction has changed but in substance the transaction actually is the same so just merely because the context changes but let's say the substance remains the same our analysis remains the same the methodology to adopt and the comparability analysis if it's same will you still get covered under this particular option or would it be considered as a separate transaction uh, my sense is that <clears throat> where you need to look at in these kind of cases where uh, except for the optics everything remains the same you should treat it as something similar so you may have a different outcome in terms of pricing for the year but whether all these transactions can get covered as similar transaction yes i think uh, it should be so and uh, my informal interactions uh, with the authorities uh, seem to suggest that they also would be open to look at this particular kind of an approach right interesting uh, uh, nikita yeah uh, i have a final question uh, so is the cancellation of the entire apa agreement in case of any procedural lapse on the part of an applicant uh, a very harsh provision and uh, if yes what would the repercussion be hasan yeah so i think so, you know this particular point is covered in the uh, faq question number 6 where uh, the point is raised that in case the um, in the roll back uh, agreement there's agreement uh, done on the roll back and there are some terms and conditions of the uh, which are not being fulfilled whatever it may be then the question was whether the only the roll back gets nullified or the entire agreement uh, and the answer to that is that uh, the entire agreement gets cancelled i think this is very very onerous and everybody needs to be quite sensitive about it that for a lapse in the roll back uh, conditions can actually cancel the entire agreement for 9 years so i think somewhere if um, uh, some kind of a liberal approach could have been adopted on this particular matter that have would have been very good but nevertheless now the faqs are very clear so i would believe i would suggest that every tax payer should be very very careful about this particular condition mr singh any quick comments on uh, the cancellation part uh, is, is this fair you know uh, i agree with asnan that this uh, you know is, uh, is is should not have been there 
because this is totally i mean uh, you know it uh, upsets the entire effort to reach a conclusion which is uh, you know win win situation for the taxpayer as well as for the tax authorities and uh, as we shall mention one thing i mean is that uh, Uh, you know uh, if you look at this uh, rollback uh, faq is uh, one step in the process of development of regulation so uh, it's it's uh, what nature it is is it a circular is it instruction or is it view of the tax authorities now if it is the view of the tax authorities then in that case one can go and tell them that look here you are not right so the option of getting it modified is still there it is not law definitely it has not come out in the form of instruction or circular so i think i mean they are trying to learn from the experience hear from the taxpayers uh, because i don't think that uh, you know the authorities would be interested in killing it they are also interested in projecting a figure uh, you know a picture of india as uh, a non adversarial tax regime and apm has been introduced uh, as a right step in that direction so i think you know if people go and explain to them how it is creating problem i am sure that they will uh, you know give a very patient hearing uh, you know we are talking we are talking about the uh, you know the on the conceptual basis but once two or three cases go to to them and show how it is creating real hardship i am sure the authorities will uh, you know have a positive attitude and not try to enforce it right that's that, that's a, a very uh, uh, sort of a positive perspective uh, uh, you know we we've, we've had uh, itids conclusion and few other uh, aps getting concluded uh, looking forward uh, looking forward uh, uh, the the authorities have received significant number of applications in this year as well the last year's applications are still in process uh, a lot of bilaterals Uh, or also, uh, you know, getting uh, 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 are moving forward very quickly. Uh, Vishal, uh, in terms of the bilateral uh, APA specifically, uh, and within unilaterals, other sectors. Which are the key sectors which you think uh, uh, will have a priority in this uh, rest of the months? Uh, and and how do you see bilateral APA specifically shaping up in the in the rest of the year? so i think uh, you know we with the number of applications in the it it sector and with you know one apa out of the way i think we are going to see a lot more progress pretty quickly now in the it its routine sort of uh, space i think we would have had lot more closures in march itself but i think lot of companies applied for a roll back i mean several of our cases were in pretty advanced stages and you know we could have pushed and Uh, you know got a closure before 31st march but they got soft pedal because a lot of those companies applied for a roll back so now i think again there are several who have said we don't want a roll back site visits done all you know paperwork complete and all i think next few weeks months i think several of it its would get closed bilateral uh, as well i think it depends again i think as hasnain mentioned it's a tax driven pro- tax payer driven process the more proactive the taxpayer and their advisors are the faster you will be you know more ahead in the queue you would be and you know the same works for the uh, you know other uh, competent authority uh, so you know with uk japan again we have had one bilateral apa for japan similar uh, cases in the same industry with the roll back uh, in in place for that i'm sure uh, we are hopeful couple of our cases there Uh, with Japan will get resolved pretty quickly as soon as the you know arithmetic around rollback is sorted and all that. Uh, and in the IT ITS space as well, uh, you know, with the unilateral APA out and you know the progress made on the bilateral front with UK and the framework agreed with US, uh, I think a lot more in IT ITS, the bilateral as well as unilateral will will go out. Also, right. some of the, you know routine ones like investment advisory will be in place. i think they can be closed pretty quickly as well right mr singh uh, in unilateral apa specifically which are the other sectors uh, that you are seeing uh, will have a uh, are getting traction and uh, you see a early closure number one and number two which are the transactions uh, we we've, we've earlier heard about interest related transactions and, and, and few royalty related transactions uh, uh, 
uh, getting an early attention from the revenue authority so which are the other sectors and which are the other transactions that you see an early closure in the rest of this year you know uh, first i mean of course it it because they have uh, got experience in map and like that the second one is uh, the you know the investment advisory and the and the most interesting thing which is happening that the tax authorities are not confining themselves only to these two sector which are cross plus but they are also looking at very complex uh, you know issues where which are in the, in the form of profit is played or in or even uh, you know the corporate recharge uh, i am observing and we are participating in negotiating such uh, aps which are really complex but the authorities are looking at those so uh, my uh, take is that yes there will be resolution of several APAs on unilateral because uh, you know if one goes for the bilateral the whole process will be delayed but there will be several unilateral APAs on IT IT is investment support service but at the same time there will be few in, uh, which will be addressing very complex issues like uh, management services and even the profit split methodology or a totally different form of uh, uh you know uh, distributing the profit between the group companies which one could not have got resolution in the normal uh, uh, dispute resolution process right so uh, in your, your comments on uh, which are the transactions specifically uh, that 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 you see uh, will be uh, getting closed sooner okay so i think this year is going to be the year of apa closures and uh, uh, the government itself has kept a very very ambitious target for themselves of closing at least 100 apas this year uh, i think keeping that particular target itself uh, is really on the positive side so hopefully if we are very close to that particular number uh, i think it will be a very big positive message to the entire industry in terms of uh, uh, the industry of the sectors obviously it's going to be it its which will be the largest chunk because they have been uh, the largest chunk of the api application uh, second as both vishal and mr singh mentioned uh, investment advisory and there is a lot of trading uh, company who have applied for the again on the margins and uh, on uh, in fact there is now a lot of encouragement from the uh, ap authorities to look at more complex kind of uh, also because once they have uh, got some kind of a reference point in all these particular industries they are now looking at other cases which are very very fact specific so one of the case which is there is more on a, a hurdle of hurdle royalty rates based on the profitability in of the indian company so these kind of cases profit split cases they will start moving up a lot but i'm not very sure whether they will get concluded but at least few of them should get completed in this particular year and i think that will be a very big positive right uh, vishal uh a quick question a, a, a very a very short uh, answer if you could provide is uh, in light of all the apas that have been filed in last couple of years and especially uh, this year uh, and some of the results that you have seen from ap and discussions how are they getting translated into the transfer pricing studies uh, which which the taxpayers will undertake in next couple of months when the pp audit also has to be filed before november very brief comment shall uh so i think uh, the clearly the message has been that if uh, um, now that you know this uh, the 17 to 19 sort of range uh, in when i think some of the companies have really looked at evaluating their margins if they are going to look at uh, going in for an ap because as i mentioned some of them wanted to play it safe by p what cost plus 20 22 didn't happen now with the ap is closing I think that some of them would be revisiting the uh, the model itself. Documentation is still fact based, so if nothing changes, then nothing changes. But yeah, revisiting the policy, uh, maybe yes, definitely. Asmin, any any specific experience uh, on this that you've had with your clients? In terms of revising the uh, documentation based on this particular revising documentation and how these experiences are getting translated. into current years transfer pricing audits sorry not audits the transfer pricing documentation and the certification that will happen yeah so you see obviously uh, these margins are giving a lot of kind of uh, reference points so people are getting colored by it 
uh, are rather taking some guidance from it. So wherever the margins are on the lower side, they are now keen to look at it on a little bit of a very closer to this. And wherever the margins were on the higher side, they want to see whether they can come to these particular type of margins. And the other things, especially on the cost base, where a specific focus is there, both of the revenue authorities as well as the legal authorities. I think that is their area of focus to relook and see whether there are any kind of such expenses which need to be factored into the documentation as well as the cost base. So I think these are the two things which we need to be looked at. But otherwise, uh, in terms of the FAR analysis, whatever was done in the past, obviously uh, that should hold good because the assumption is that yes, they have been looking at the right kind of a FAR analysis. Right, Mr. Singh, uh, and, and this is the last question. And let me begin with Mr. Singh. You we began the hangout wherein you mentioned uh, APA is a uh, is a tool which uh, which government sort of uh, announced. Uh, and it sort of supports the non-adversarial tax regime uh, policy of the government. Looking at the experiences you had in last uh, six, six, eight months, uh, do you think that is getting achieved? Uh, you know, when you are looking at, I mean, the achievement, it is not only the final result which is important, but the process is equally important. When I say process, it means the way the questions are being put, the way, I mean, the facts are being appreciated become very, very important. The number of APs going to be concluded will pick up now because once they have closed IT, ITS, it is likely that they will be able to close several and as uh, Asnan rightly said that a very steep target has been uh, put by themselves. So uh, the other thing which is having an impact uh, will be on the, you know, the TPO and uh, the other actions taken by the department. So this approach of the APA is giving a learning experience for everybody, whether for the taxpayer and for the tax authorities. So far as the success of the APA in creating a non-adversarial tax regime is concerned, I would say that they have achieved a lot because once you meet them, talk to them and find that they are looking at your facts in a very op with open mind, that gives a lot of confidence that, okay, it is getting delayed, but the result will be something which will be acceptable which is a great message to be conveyed to the taxpayer. Right, Vishal? No, I think uh, I can't, uh, can't agree more. Satisfactory process, satisfactory result. Timing is an issue, but I think most people will take it to avoid going through the pain of hitting it. Asnin, your, your concluding comments? Yeah, so I already gave to you all yesterday. Uh, this has been a very, very satisfying uh, process. And uh, I think the best part is that the AP authorities have been very open-minded to fair suggestions and wherever we had some kind of a concerns on the practical implementation and we came up with uh, suggestions, they have rationalized it, looked at it and uh, in many cases accepted that. So I think uh, this is a very kind of a positive message uh, to any taxpayer who comes along for all these kind of conversations. The way it is, it's not driven by a one-sided kind of an approach to look at some kind of a uh, particular direction and it is more kind of a fair and uh, objective uh, assessment. So I think the messaging is very, very good and uh, I would just conclude by saying it was a very satisfying experience. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much for all your comments, uh, uh, Mr. Singh, Vishal, Hasnin uh, and Nikita uh, for, for, for sharing your thoughts, uh, issues, questions. Uh, uh, to, uh, with, with us. Uh, thank you so much for, for sparing your time as well and uh, we really hope that uh, the APA process will, will be an effective dispute resolution uh, solution uh, in the next few months to come. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye.